The world is a wide and weird place. Down darkened alleyways, on rugged roads, in the heart of nowhere, and even in the familiar corners of our homes, some of the strangest and most sinister entities are said to lurk. These creatures are not your typical monsters, but, just as ghosts fright and werewolves bite, they are whispered to have ominous intentions. What follows are tales connected to five such entities, entities which, when encountered, are claimed to cause nothing but woe. It can be said that there are few places more magical than Dartmoor. A national park located in the southwest of England, the landscape is wild and beautiful. Ponies roam freely over craggy outcrops and legend layer tours, and gleaming rivers cut through forests, pushing into open wetlands, sometimes dense with fog, sometimes bright with sunlight. Magical, indeed. And yet, this vast moorland's magic is not all sunshine and ponies, for Dartmoor is also whispered to be a place of darkness. At its heart lies Dartmoor Prison, a reputedly haunted, thick granite walled jail, once, and quite possibly still, home to some of the UK's most dangerous criminals. The National Park is also said to provide shelter to the Hairy Hands, an ominous entity of local legend that is claimed to be responsible for the misfortune, and indeed death, of many. Encounters with the Hairy Hands date back to the early 20th century, when visitors to Postbridge, a hamlet in the heart of Dartmoor, began to report experiencing unusual accidents caused by a pair of disembodied hands. It is said that whilst driving along the narrow moors lane outside of Postbridge, the hands would appear suddenly and attempt to grab the steering wheel of the vehicle in which they manifest, or indeed the handlebars of the bicycle or motorcycle. Having wrestled control away from the driver, the hands would then force the vehicle off the road. In most instances, the victims survived and were able to tell their tale, warning others about the spectral hands, most commonly described as a gruesome and hairy pair, calloused and unnaturally strong. In some cases, people described the hands which fought them off the road as invisible. The consequence of their malevolent influence, a battered and bent bumpered car, being the only thing that could be seen. As terrifying as the claims were, they were, for the most part, regarded as little more than a curious, if scary, story. It wasn't until the summer of 1921 that people in the area began to take the reports more seriously. Dr. E. H. Helby, the medical officer for Dartmoor Prison, was driving along the lane on his motorcycle, his two young daughters riding in his sidecar. The prison was only a short distance from the hamlet, the lonely lane on which he drove connecting Postbridge to Princetown, the village on whose edge the jail stood. In the course of their journey, Helby is thought to have lost control of his motorcycle. Seemingly under assault by an unseen force, he is said to have shouted at his daughters to jump from the speeding sidecar. They did, and watched as their father, still wrestling the handlebars, swerved off the road he perished at the scene. After that, encounters with the hairy hands became more frequent. Only a few short weeks after Dr. Helby's passing, on the 26th of August 1921, an army captain reported being assaulted by a pair of invisible hands as he drove along the same stretch of road. Also riding a motorcycle, he claimed that the sinister extremities took hold of him and, with great violence, forced him off the road. The captain was ultimately more fortunate than Halby, and went on to file a report, bringing more attention to the growing phenomenon. Soon after, news of the doctor's fatal accident, and the captain's subsequent encounter, spread across the country, with publications including the London Daily Mail reporting on the hairy hands at the time. In the years afterwards, many others have reported similar encounters, including the local journalist and author Rufus Endel. Describing his encounter to another writer, he claimed that he only managed to avoid a crash by fighting for control. The pair of hands supposedly gripped the driving wheel and tried to force him off the road. With the ability to cause such destruction, the legend of the hairy hands is undoubtedly chilling, especially when one considers how not all encounters occur in moving vehicles. One of the most sinister encounters is said to have taken place in 1924, when a young couple were camping close to the road on which the hands had been seen to manifest. 
It was the middle of the night, and they were asleep in their caravan. An instinctual fear is said to have woken the woman. In the dim light, she was horrified to see a large, hair-covered hand crawl, disembodied, across the window of the caravan. Believing that it was trying to get inside and cause her and her husband harm, the lady is claimed to have made the sign of the cross, at which the spectral hand retreated. Attempts to explain the hairy hands are varied, with some citing the proximity of Dartmoor Prison and the numerous dark tales associated with its ghostly residence as the cause. Others, who are more skeptical of the story, claim that the unfortunate road accidents associated with the hands are simply that, unfortunate, and caused by nothing more than the treacherous camber of the narrow moorland road. With the legend arising again and again, whatever the cause, a dose of caution when traversing the haunt of the infamous hairy hands may well be a matter of life and death. Many mysteries lie in the realm of dreams. When we sleep, our consciousness dissolves into something else, and in that space many believe there are entities waiting to strike. Most often, these entities are said to manifest while we are in a state known as sleep paralysis. Sleep paralysis occurs either at the beginning or end of sleep, and it entails full awareness of the situation around you, but an absolute paralysis of the body. Thus, you are fully aware, but can do nothing when the entities associated with this state of consciousness are said to be present. One entity which is believed to appear all over the world to people experiencing sleep paralysis is the Hat Man. Described as a tall male figure with a broad-rimmed hat and a trench coat, he is said to be without facial features. All that exists in the place of his face is darkness. One person who claims to have encountered this entity is Tim Brown from Nashville, Tennessee. According to his testimony, he first saw the hat man lingering outside his bedroom door, staring at him as he was in a state of sleep paralysis. He described being terrified as his whole body remained immobile. The hat man, for his part, did nothing. Millie stared and increased Brown's fear. Once Brown snapped out of his paralysis, he described how he jumped from his bed, screaming, expecting to be able to confront the hat-wearing intruder. There was, however, no one there. If the stories are to be believed, there never is. There are many similar experiences to Brown's, with people sharing their stories all across the internet. One lady called Courtney described on a dedicated Hatman Facebook group how she encountered the same figure when she was a child in the 1980s. The entity, she wrote, was wearing a hat and was very shadow-like. Another testimony from someone called Victor stated that the hat man returned to his bedroom night after night. Scientists who have analysed people who experience sleep paralysis regularly have noticed that very real symptoms do usually accompany these inexplicable experiences. People in a state of sleep paralysis have been found to experience breathing problems, heart palpitations, sweating, and trembling. More terrifying are the very rare cases of sudden unexpected nocturnal death syndrome, known in Asia as nightmare death syndrome. It has been speculated that, as the name suggests, people can indeed perish in their sleep when experiencing a nightmare. As our understanding of dreams and by extension nightmares is limited, science is unable to offer an explanation as to why this might occur. Breathing problems, heart palpitations, and in the worst case death, are all fear responses and not something we would expect to occur during sleep. Thus, what is the stimulus? Perhaps, as so many people have claimed, the hat man really does exist, and that when he appears during a state of sleep paralysis, he does more than merely stare at his paralysed victims. Triggering a fear response of deadly proportions, it may well be that for some, he is the last thing they ever see. In 19th century Victorian England, tales circulated of a terrifying and sinister figure. One of the earliest alleged cases documenting this entity occurred in 1837 in London to a serving woman called Mary Stevens. As she was walking through Clapham Common, a dark figure supposedly leapt at her from a dark alley. 
It gripped her with its arms and began kissing her face frantically, all the while tearing off her clothes with its claws. Far from belonging to a flesh and blood attacker, Stevens described the claws of the being as being as cold and clammy as those of a corpse. In sheer and absolute terror, the serving woman screamed, a sound which so unnerved her assailant that they ran away. The very next day, this same figure was seen jumping in front of a moving carriage, an action that caused it to lose control and crash. The driver of the carriage was seriously injured. Those who witnessed the accident were shocked. It was said that the entity which had caused the crash afterwards jumped over a nine-foot wall, howling in a fit of maniacal laughter as it did. After this incident, the press dubbed the entity spring Heel Jack a sprightly figure whose reign of terror continued throughout the 19th century and, if the stories are to be believed, right up until the modern day. One year after the original incident, in 1838, matters got so out of hand that the Lord Mayor of London had a pile of letters on his desk relating to assaults committed by spring Jack, describing how many women were severely wounded by a sort of clause the miscreant wore on his hands. In a public session held in January of that year, the Lord Mayor recounted a complaint handed to him which stated how the unmanly villain had succeeded in depriving seven ladies of their senses. Whilst personally sceptical, believing the reports to be filled with the greatest exaggerations, the Lord Mayor recognised that there was a threat to public order. Thus, he declared that the miscreant responsible for this pantomime display would be hunted down and punished. As such, the police went on a manhunt, and rewards were offered for the capture of spring Jack. In spite of this, he eluded them all. And so, the sensational events and failed apprehension of 1838 forever cemented spring Jack in British folklore. Two of the most famous cases connected to the entity both occurred in London in February 1838 to two teenage girls, Lucy Scales and Jane Alsop. Alsop described encountering Jack in the guise of a police officer who came to her home asking for a light. After handing the supposed officer a candle, the figure reportedly threw off his cloak and presented a most hideous and frightful appearance to the young woman. His eyes were described as being like red balls of fire. He then, slashing at her with his claws, attempted to tear off her clothes. A struggle and Alsop ran from his grasp only to be caught again by the terrifying assailant on the steps of her home. Fortunately, the young woman's sisters were able to rescue her, but Jack was able to escape. Days later, an 18-year-old Lucy Scales was also attacked by spring Jack whilst walking home with her sister. In her report to the police, she stated that a quantity of blue flame was spurted into her face by the assailant making her drop to the floor and convulse violently for hours afterwards. Attacks on women and carriages became the modus operandi for spring Jack for the rest of the century. Far from being a mortal attacker, he long outlived any human villain. As such, many believed him to be the devil incarnate on Earth. Indeed, a similarly described figure to Jack was reported again in the 1970s, this time north of London in Sheffield. A rash of sightings of a being with an incredible ability to jump extraordinary lengths and burning red eyes gripped the area. One witness, echoing the statements made over a century before, said of his encounter, I honestly think he was the devil. Seemingly not bound by time or place, spring Jack has also been seen in other countries. In Prague, from 1938 to 1945, another figure similar to Jack was sighted across the city. He was dubbed Perak the Spring Man. Later, in the autumn of 1985, another possible spring Jack sighting occurred in Miami Beach, Florida. A security guard was called to the scene after people reported seeing a strangely dressed man with a top hat wandering around the area. The guard swore that he, too, saw the figure. When he confronted him, extraordinarily, the top hat-wearing fiend ran away and easily leapt over a ten-foot-high fence topped with barbed wire. Concerned a criminal was trying to steal goods from the fenced area, the police conducted a thorough search to no avail. After this incident, the security guard was ridiculed and subsequently demoted to the point that he had to quit his job. 
And so, testimonies of encounters with Spring-Heeled Jack are abundant, and many believe that it is only a matter of time before he strikes again. According to the Swiss psychiatrist Carl Jung, the shadow is a part of our unconscious personality. Our shadow side can thus include everything outside of our consciousness, most especially those less desirable aspects of our personality that we do not wish to acknowledge. Repressed, hidden in the dark chambers of our unconsciousness, the shadow is something that everyone carries. Largely negative, driven by the primitive animal instincts with which we are born, the less the shadow is embodied in the individual's conscious life, the blacker and denser it is. Far from being a mere psychological construct, there are many who believe the unconscious shadow is an inner demon, a manifestation of each of our darker dimensions that can, and indeed does, influence the physical world. Existing on the border between the known and the unknown, it can be thought of as a spiritual doppelganger, most often lurking, but entirely capable of possessing a human host should it gain enough power. One of the most common places people are said to encounter their shadow is in dreams. As this entity belongs to the unconscious realm, it is claimed to be stronger when we are asleep. Dreams in which we are trapped in endless hallways, or are forced to fight monstrous creatures are considered to be the shadow's doing. In slumber, our persona, our conscious social face which we present to the world, comes into conflict with the shadow which is presented by the psyche as all manner of horrors, from devils and goblins to shadow vampires and terrible animal hybrid creatures. In this way, the shadow is, at its heart, a manifestation of all that humankind has collectively experienced or come to consider as evil. And its ultimate aim is merger, domination over and merger with our conscious self. In rare instances, when the shadow gains enough power, it is said to be able to project itself into the physical world. Known as autoscopic phenomena, this involves the self encountering itself. In its most simple form, an autoscopic encounter may involve feeling the presence of someone beside you without being able to see them. In more extreme instances, the shadow is able to manifest physically as an independent form a form which is not merely visible, but can be interacted with also. While some regard such encounters as mere hallucination, others who claim to have encountered their shadow selves are certain that what they saw was real. Online and elsewhere, there are innumerable stories of people reporting disturbing encounters with their shadow twins, a common theme being the doppelganger being witnessed by friends and family members, who mistakenly believe that the other is the real person. In one such account, the experiencer reported encountering their father's doppelganger. The figure, which looked identical to their real father and roused no immediate suspicions, was at home, in the bathroom drying himself after a shower, when the father should have been at work. When the experiencer, then an eight-year-old child, questioned their father as to why they were at home, the figure did not reply. Speechless, he merely closed the door, retreating from the conversation. It wasn't until shortly afterwards that they realised that their father was indeed at work, where he should have been. A top-to-bottom search of the house did not uncover the intruder. Later that day, the father still at work, the sinister other was seen again, this time by the experiencer's mother, the father's wife. Who or what the figure was, was never determined. Such behaviour does, however, conform to what is theorised about the shadow usually hidden, in times of personal crisis, when our conscious personality is weakened, the shadow may step out from the very shadows that is its own existence, and overtake our physical body and conscious self, either as an independent form, or, in the worst case, through direct possession. With the shadow a part of us all, it may well be that some of us have already been overtaken, and that friend, family member or neighbour who seems changed, somewhat ruder, somewhat darker and more vindictive than they were before, has succumbed to their shadow self. Before we investigate our final ominous entity, I'd like to take a moment to talk about membership to my Quill and Ink Society, and my new Patreon-exclusive Gold Tier Membership perk. Earlier in the year, I released the Paranormal Scholar Silver Metal Pins to members. 
Beautiful and custom made, complete with a signed certificate of authenticity, they are what I hope is a true collectible for members. A unique way for me to say thank you for all of the support members have shown to the channel over the years. With that in mind, I am extremely excited to announce a new custom merchandise pack. A gold tier pin, complete with a custom engraved The Paranormal Scholar Parker pen and a mirrored quill and ink sticker. In designing and having these items made, I wanted something of true quality that I myself love and want to use. And I really do love all three items, my own Quill and Ink Society pen being at my side whenever I make notes when researching for videos. And so I hope that you will feel the same. As with the Silver Tier Badge perk, these exclusive merchandise sets are available to all Patreon members regardless of tier, once a certain pledge threshold is reached. Membership via Patreon is the only way to get your hands on these limited edition pieces, so if you are interested in adding them to your collection and helping to support the work that I do in the process, please do visit my Patreon page. Membership also includes many other perks such as commercial free videos, the chance to vote for video topics, and of course, access to my two-hour documentary In Search of the Dead. I cannot wait to get these gold tier membership packs sent out and hope you enjoy them as much as I do. With that said, let us continue with the video. Within the realm of fiction, there is no lack of horrifying clowns. Yet, it may be that reality is far more terrifying than any fiction has been able to portray. Since 1980, there have been reports of carloads of clowns prowling the streets across the world searching for young victims. In 1981, there were mass sightings of such clowns all across America, described by those who had encountered them as trying to entice children to come to them by silently beguiling them with colourful balloons and candy. The Netherlands had their own spate of sightings in 1987, as did Honduras in 1995, and many other locations around the world right up to the present day. Most famously, there were mass sightings of so-called creepy clowns in 2016, which escalated to the point that authorities were forced to ban the sale of clown costumes in many locations around the world as people formed anti-clown mobs to roam the streets and hunt them down. Whilst many clown sightings are indeed just people dressing up, there are some who argue that certain encounters indicate there is more to the phenomenon than human menace. Many sightings leave no physical evidence. In fact, clowns have been known to disappear right in front of the witness, leading some to believe in the existence of ghost clowns. One such case of a ghost clown was recorded in the Lakes Mall in Fort Lauderdale, Florida in 1985. Allegedly, there were reports at the time of a clown stalking the corridors behind the individual stores. These corridors were reserved for employees and maintenance workers, so there was no reason for a member of the public dressed as a clown to be there. It is said that when one of the store's employees approached a clown they saw in the corridor, the clown vanished after walking behind a wall. Concerned that there was an unauthorized person up to no good, a thorough search was conducted by the mall's security. No trace of the clown was found. Shortly afterwards, another clown sighting was reported, this time at the theater, near the rear exit. Witnesses describe seeing an unsmiling clown standing by the dumpster, staring, unnervingly, at moviegoers as they left the theatre. When someone decided to confront the clown, the figure allegedly ran into the nearby woods and disappeared. Disturbingly, this case is far from singular. Researcher and author Greg Jenkins has documented several cases such as this one in Florida alone. In his book, Chronicles of the Strange and Uncanny in Florida, Jenkins remarks that there seems to be a trend between clown sightings and outdated indoor shopping centers. And these clown sightings really do have a spectral quality. During the mass clown scare that ravaged the United States in 1981, a Boston police officer reported in the news that they had over 20 calls on 911, but no adult civilian or police officer has ever seen a clown. The fact that physical evidence and suspects are very rarely ever encountered make clown sightings truly ominous. Are they people dressed in costumes, or something even more sinister? 
Many have claimed that the clown scares are due to the popularity of horror films and books which depict evil clowns, such as Poltergeist and Stephen King's It. Yet, these two films, alongside other media depicting scary clowns, came out after the mass clown scare of 1981. Thus, it seems to not be so much a case of life imitating art, but art imitating life. And so, where did these clowns come from? Or, more importantly still, where did they go? Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe for more of the paranormal. Equally, if you are interested in supporting our work further and becoming a member of our Quillending Society, why not click the link in the description. Included in membership is access to commercial free videos, the chance to vote in polls, to decide video topics, and exclusive to Patreon members, custom The Paranormal Scholar merchandise. Thank you again for watching. Until next time.